Welcome. Well, we're starting to get people joining us in the webinar here. Really excited to be having the opportunity to share some great ideas and perhaps challenge a few ideas about where learning actually takes place. I want to introduce to you Paul Mallon. He's a gym and swim coach from way back, but has had 35 years in education in a variety of leadership roles and teaching roles. He's been a pastoral care and senior leader in uh, Chinese International School in Hong Kong, and is now currently a consultant and working through his own business with supporting schools and students um, with his, his work on the internal learning environment. He's at, currently at the International School of Lausanne as a consultant with an MA in education, working with NIASC, with uh, Swiss schools and also with IB. So he understands a lot and has a lot of experience in education. I was drawn to this particular topic because it is fascinating to be thinking we normally spend a lot of time thinking about the external environment in education, but here we're looking at and being asked to encourage and think about the internal environment and how we can support that. So what I want to do now, I am super eager to, to hear about how we can support kids. I have a six-year-old grandson who cannot sit still and Paul is going to help me help him. So really looking forward to hearing from you, Paul. Please, the floor is yours. Without further ado, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining today. Really excited to be uh, presenting and uh, just hope to start a conversation if you're not already having one about where it, it, uh, learning takes place. So we'll start with that first slide that you can see there. Um, where does learning take place? A question for you. Um, just have a think about that. You can type comments into the, into the chat room if you want to. Note something down and just think about where does learning take place? If we're in a, in a room, we might break out and, and discuss that. There aren't any wrong answers. So where does learning take place? And I'll, you'll see where my thoughts are as we go through the presentation. Um, here's one student's opinion about some work that we did together. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my, team, my name is Shane again. Uh, I've been working with Mr. Mountain for three or four years. I can't remember exactly. Um, I saw a student in year three and it helped me for these past years. Then we kept working, working, and I got stronger and stronger, and it's been amazing. So Finnegan and I did some work together. It was amazing. What was amazing for Finnegan? His experience was he had made an improvement of five reading levels in six months. 13 points in writing, stop seeing the counsellor. His learning support decreased 66% from one year to the next. And the occupational therapist indicated normal in all of his tests rather than problem. So Finnegan was altogether happier. How did we create this amazing experience for Finnegan? Well, what I did was I assessed his sensory systems. I assessed his, mus his muscular systems and his sensory motor system activities. And from that, I then implemented, I built and implemented a specific targeted exercise plan. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what we did is we then worked on that plan each day. And I, the initial thing was for six months, but it went on and on and on because it worked and Finn really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it too. Okay, what, what I'm talking about is not this. It's not physical education. It's not well-being. It's not movement breaks. And it's not recess. Now, all of those things are underpinned by the same science as to why we include them and why they're important to be included. But the first two tend to be delivered in units with a cognitive emphasis on it that we need to check that people are cognitively aware of what, the, what we've gone through and that we can do that. And then we practice some of the things within those, those uh, areas. And movement breaks and recess are when, are when the adults decide that the this, this children get the freedom to move. <clears throat> so all these things here, we allow movement and we, we talk about the cognition of it, but uh, these are all adult decisions and adult-led. Adult 
What it is, it's proactive daily physical activity. <clears throat> it's based on individual physiological needs for both immediate needs and long-term development. And it's for all learners, adults too. The parents, when we talk to the parents, they get really interested. Hang on a minute, sounds like me. Well, yeah, it is. And it's owned and implemented by the learners, be they three years old or 60 years old. It is called access to learning. And in an adult's way, if you like, it's access to performance. And in what, the, what we're measuring in, in school is learning, so it's access to learning, but in a wider context, it's access to, to performance. And specific target exercise program is a core part. It's specific because it's specific to you. We've done some assessments. We are looking at, you are thinking about what it is um, that you need. We are then targeting those needs and we are planning how to physiologically develop those needs over time. And then you, you get a, a knowledge base how you can affect your behavior in the short term and your performance in the short term, but also how you can build into the future. So if you like, it's a, it's a life skill. It's a true life skill because you'll have it for life. Um, it is more than exercise. It prioritizes function before a product. It leads to habits, allowing us to be well. Parents and teachers must value it. It is based on a learner's right to have physiological access to learning. Students own it and operate it. And the key is that these are all non-negotiables in learning. If a child is going to be able to access the learning around them, these are non-negotiable. So when we look at the LPs later, for me, this is the, the core of the conversation that should be happening in schools about how we implement the learning principles in, a, in an ACE, NIASC um, ideological world in the 21st century. And I've pulled this one out, um, a learner's right to have physiological access to learning. The science and neuroscience is there to tell us how learning happens within us. So we must therefore create that physiological environment within the learner so that they can actually access the learning. Otherwise, we're just assessing the, the status quo of where they are. Um, in that context, the ACE Learning Guide and Ecosystems, the learning principles, LP2, has in it saying the regular engagement of physical experiences Physical experiences, all learning is physical, all learning uh, has a derivative of something physical. And if there's a problem, we go to something physical to fix it. We get a little bit where the cognition is where maybe that's a little bit vague, but really everything relies on physical. And experiences are great, but this doesn't say anything about development. So a PE lesson, um, recess time, um, well-being, these are physical experiences and cognitive experiences, but there's no physiological development inherent in what we're doing. We should, LP2 gives us an opportunity to go searching for that physiological um, development in our programs and in the, the, the knowledge base. So here's one learner, specific learner. This is Charlie, my youngest son. And I, I started off with saying, where, is, where does learning take place? Well, for me, learning takes place inside the inside of us um, it might happen in a room might happen anywhere but wherever that wherever you are the learning is happening inside of you physically and you are the person in those different environments so if your internal environment doesn't work it doesn't really matter which environment you go into people might make it more accessible or less accessible your learning environment is within you so here is charlie and here is let's have a look at what's inside Charlie's learning environments. There's eight sensory systems. Here they are. Now, I won't go into too much detail here, but these two here are very important for learning the vestibular and the proprioceptive. Let's take a closer look. So here's a picture of it. So the proprioceptive system, the feedback we're getting through our muscles, our bones, our skin, 
all traveling up through our uh, spinal column, up into the cerebellum where it gets processed and helps us to know where we are in space and time. And this is coordinating with the eyes and the ears, the vestibular system, the, the inner ear with the fluid inside it. And as I say, it, these two systems together are allowing us to know where we are in space and time. If they don't work, what do we need to do? We're going to need to push something. We're going to need to shake around. We're going to need to do whatever it is. So when we say, here's some freedom, go into recess, run around, children will go do what they want to do. When we pull them back in, we're going to ask them to do the hardest thing that we ask them to do at school, sit down and listen. And these two systems are the systems that are going to actually allow them to sit down and listen. And when we look at how these eight systems fit together, there's only seven down here, interoception's not here, but these two here will lead to, if they're not well developed, there'll be an attention center function uh, deficit, and then we'll see behavior function deficit. And this is a layering of how um, learning works. And we'll come back to this in a little bit. But, um, We won't come back to it a little bit, here it is. So academic learning uh, and daily living activities and behavior, this triangle at the top is how we are, um, how we view school. This is what school is all about. Behavior, how we socially behave together, living activities, things that we do that are good for us and academic learning. Um, how many points are we gonna get at IB? What are these things gonna happen to us? are we learning cognitively correctly? But for this to work, um, as we can see by Taylor and Trott's diagram of work done by Gene Ayers over 45, 50 years ago, um, and represented by Williams and Schellenberger's Pyramid of Learning diagram, first of all, the sensory systems have to work, then the sensory motor development has to kick in, and then the perceptual uh, motor development has to work. And then if we get all this correct, then we can assess this, I think, um, favorably in terms of we've, we've at least given learners an opportunity to access the learning that we're trying to assess and see what happens. The, all these things must layer up and must be built upon for a child to be able to access the learning that we provide outside them in a school. Now my uh, slides have got stuck. Okay, there we go. So we're gonna keep on going through the, the, the systems, the, the skeletal system, the muscular system and interoception, what's going on in your internal organs. And then we have the nervous system. I like this picture because it shows an outline of us on the outside. So this could be Charlie, there's his outline and here's all the nerves representing information traveling from the brain up the spinal, up and down the spinal cord. Um, this is the learning system. All of these things that we talked about, this is the learning system which gets processed. Um, and cognition is how we form synapses about the information that we, we've got. And a really important part of this, reading uh, Williams and Schellenberger, How Does Your Engine Run, was their analysis of um, top-down and bottom-up inhibition. And I would... Uh, but so what we're looking at is when we go to school, we're really looking at the cerebral cortex. And what we as teachers and parents are trying to do is inhibit, top down inhibit um, the rest of the brain, the rest of the body. And we're trying to top down inhibit the, the learning process. So we're giving information through the eyes and the ears to the cerebral cortex to say, this is what's important to learn. And we're expecting the brain and our, our body to be able to shut down and sit and listen. So this sitting and listening, this cultural pose of learning, sit and listen. And this is how we do it, suppress, and we say what's good and bad about, about movements and things like that. Now, at the same time, the, the, the rest of the, the whole function of the body is feeding up through the cerebellum, and it is telling you whether you are safe or not, whether you are needing to move if, if you know where you are in space and time, along with the eyes and the ears. And that is trying to inhibit what you're doing. 
because it, if it needs to move, if it needs security, it's basically telling the Subaru, no, don't pay attention to that. You need to know where you are. You need to know that you're safe first. So this red line here, I've drawn a red line in here. There's this kind of fight going on between the two. And one way we can get attention, we know this, is if we add some adrenaline in, if we shout, we can switch off the bottom-up inhibition systems. So we can switch those off and then I uh, hear lots of comments. Why do they only listen when I'm shouting? Why do they only listen when there's, a, when there's an ultimatum? Well, that's why, because it's a physiological reaction. The, the amygdala, the adrenaline, that system will say, you're now in danger. So the, cerebr the cerebral cortex takes over and says, no, you're in danger from outside, not from the inside. We have some smart ways of putting in proprioceptive and vestibular bottom-up inhibition to allow cognition. And then we have the, the, the pure top-down cognition, uh, sorry, top-down inhibition. So let's look at that. Now, perhaps in what I'm preaching here, I would love you all to just stand up. Nobody can see you. Stand up, stretch your arms, and get your shoulders back. I've been talking now probably for 10 to 12 minutes, something like that, 15 minutes maybe. But stretch, get your arms back, feel free to move, jump up and down. What do you need? Because sitting and listening is not easy. And, and I've been advised not to play slides and not, but it's this is how we're gonna, this is we're getting information across. But please, I hope you've taken that time to get up and move around. Because now we're gonna ask you to sit and listen again, or I am. We're gonna talk about how this whole process works. So what we're gonna look at is um, neural activity. The teacher says, what we're going to be doing today is writing. So there's a synapse that's created. There's activity in the front of the brain and that travels down uh, this purple line here through the cerebellum and then it comes, sorry, it comes down here through the cerebellum, through the spinal cord and out into the, the arm. And then there's, a, there's a, an exchange of, of calcium and sodium, which causes contractions. And then there's a product, the product of writing. And then it travels all the way back up, this blue line here, through the cerebellum, back up to the brain where there's feedback. Um, if the green line identifying feedback, is it good or bad? So let's, let's say this, this child is having a problem writing. They're learning from this feedback uh, that that's not right, they must do it again or no, well, try harder or whatever it is. The, cere the cerebellum's got a lot of work to do because it's dealing with all those, those spatial space and time issues, but it's also dealing with the fine motor, et cetera, et cetera. And it's trying to please the people outside of the, the brain, the teachers and the parents. But what happens if uh, the shoulder joint's out of place? So typically these days, the blue deltoid part of the deltoid here will be stretched out, right stretched out forward over here somewhere. And the red one will be really tight and will cause problems in the elbow and the fingers. And then the fine motor may not work. So let's look at one learner. This is Charlie again. And this is your opportunity to take part, have a quick look and see if you can have a quick assessment of what you think might be going wrong or anything that you observe. Okay, now, what was, what was happening there? Um, again, I'm not sure if you're chatting in the, in the chat room. If you want to talk about this afterwards, you feel free to connect, contact with me. There'll be some uh, information about contacting conversations, etc. afterwards. But if you go back here, what we were noticing as parents was that Charlie was flapping. And some children were pointing and staring. This was Charlie... In, in reception three and some children were pointing and staring because he was flapping and that wasn't normal so we asked the pediatricians we asked the doctor and they said oh don't worry about it he'll grow out of it well he'll, he'll grow out of what as parents that's not acceptable he'll grow out of it no we need to know more about this so um the symptoms elbows pull back let me see if i can get elbows pulled back there we go. 
There we go. So elbows pulled back, which then has a, a reaction on the, the hands, flapping arms, walking on tiptoe. So you can see the shadows here. Both of the toes are on the floor, but the heels don't come down. So let's go to the facts. Let's go to the physical. What's the cause of that? So we did the test, the same, similar to the test with Finnegan. Charlie has a strong back in here. He has weak lower abdominals and he has proprioceptive needs. So he needs pressure. Otherwise, he doesn't know where he is in space and time. And then he could get um, kind of disturbed. So we, we had to deal with that as parents. But now we had something to work on, something factual, rather than just symptoms and opinions. Uh, I call it TPL, uh, teacher parent language, where we sit and we, we say, well, I wonder, you know, I think this and it's just go to the physical, work out what's happening physically. Um, this is Charlie seven years later. So that's the that's the impact for us as parents. We were able to uh, give our son some physical things he could work on. His school has allowed him to practice those things, but also become self-aware of those different things. And his diagnosis has changed. In the in the picture, it was shoulders were were strong and back, and then through through the the holding the learning pose sitting and listening for many, many years and sports and all the playing video games, his shoulders have come forward. So now we're having to work them backwards. But it's a, we're talking about physical things where he is understanding and it's a daily, act, a daily uh, part of his habits to think about. So you can see here we specifically, so going back to the, the, the triangle pyramid of learning, we specifically targeted, assessed and targeted proprioception motor planning, postural security and body scheme, and postural adjustment. And we've never had any conversations of any uh, problem nature about behavior, daily living activities or academic learning. So my thinking all those years ago, when I came across the triangle, kind of a moment of crystallization for me was, if we know this information, if this is physiologically and scientifically and now neuroscientifically correct, then what are, why don't we promote it in year one? Uh, what are we waiting for in year 13? I'm not sure. And also at the IB conference back in 2017, there was a self-study done by the IB talking about students' um, self-appreciation uh, self of, of how healthy they feel. And that those figures weren't great at the time. I won't, I won't quote that because I don't have that one. But what are we waiting for at year 13 when we know we know um, all these things prior to that? Um, problems somewhere here occur. Uh, oh, sorry, are we waiting for problems somewhere here and then acting? Uh, and when we do act, it's going to be a physical action that, to put it right. So back to Charlie. He's thriving, he's happy, and he's well. And he's achieved those things through being physically, by having a specific targeted plan. What more could you want as a parent? So for the next slide, I'm just going to go through how we access um, our happy place in learning, if you like. How do we actually develop um, physiologically to learn? Well, if you imagine um, you want, you're going to do the hygiene. I'll give this as a physical education because I'm a I'm a PE teacher uh, was my is my training. Um, so if if we say come jump at this, if the, the high bar was there, who in the room here would say actually no that would that's way too high. My the perceived difficulty of this is high, and my perceived ability to do it is low. Okay, if that's the case, you're going to be anxious and you're going to shy away from that. A you don't want to hurt yourself, and B you don't want to be embarrassed. If we put the the bar on the floor. Uh, your perceived ability to get over that would be high and your per the perceived difficulty is low. So that's boring and it's not a challenge. 
So if you think of that, what we've been doing that in 20th century and 19th century education, um, that's the standard way we do it. The teacher pitches the height of the bar and then students are either anxious because they can't get over the bar or they're bored because it's too easy. And for some, there'll be optimal flow. 21st century, we're now saying, well, actually, the bar can start at any height and you pick the bar and then you can put the bar up as you progress. So now all of a sudden, your perceived ability, the perceived level of difficulty you select to match your perceived level of ability. And then that puts you in this optimal flow line here. Now, if you do get, if there is a lot of anxiety happening because we get things wrong, um, Trotman and Tucker created this wonderful diagram um, about the spiral of vulnerability. So you will see people with anxiety, low self-esteem and things like the counsellor wellbeing courses and enable us to understand why we're anxious and have strategies to try and work our way back up out of this anxiety to normality. So let's move on. Those are, those are systems, but here we have uh, the teacher's view of the learning environment. Here they are, everybody's giving back the information to the teacher which we need so that we can then report on and say, no, well, they're, they're certainly attentive. I'm not really sure why they're, or well, they're doing brilliantly, but yes, they, they are engaged. And this is what I call the learning pose. Because this is the way we show respectfully and culturally that we're ready to learn. This is the student's view of, of the, the learning environment. Um, there they are. Is it 20th or 21st century style of delivery? We're not sure. But there they are, the learning pose from the, from the back. Doing a great job. I wonder why nobody is joining in. This is awesome. Why don't they ask me? Don't want to be asked. I might get it wrong. Um, sorry, please don't ask me. 20 minutes to recess, I need to move. But that would be disrespectful. So using the ability versus difficulty, optimal flow. Who do you think's in optimal flow? Who do you think's bored? Who do you think's anxious? And as you're thinking about that, what about the teacher? Is the teacher enjoying this? What about that pose they're holding? How long do they have to hold that? Is that really part of learning? So 20th century. Top-down inhibition, remember the top-down inhibition, the front of the brain, I've tried to put that dot right there in the front of Charlie's head. Maybe an even amount, an even spread of, of anxiety, optimal flow and boredom. 21st century learning where we're using curiosity to enter the task um, at our own level and then progress up this line of optimal flow much faster, probably a lot more, um, a lot less anxiety, a lot less boredom. But the, the ILE, the internal learning environment, this is what's happening to it in both of these systems during the day. We're holding the learning pose. Even if we're not, we're doing PE, we're doing those different things. This is what's happening to your battery life during that day. What happens if you could do this? What happens if the battery life could really not deplete that much because you knew how to physiologically Remain, in game, remain engaged or alter your engagement during the day. What happens about the start of the week? Internal learning environment, internal performance systems. By the end of the week, not working. Do you want to buy a car that was made on a Friday? It was the, always the old adage, no, you don't. Um, what happens if you could do that to the child or this to the internal physiology of the learner? battery life at the end of the week, pretty good. And, and the internal knowledge of how to include themselves or communicate that they're not, they can't take part and they need something physically. So in diagrammatic form, little animation there, but you were taking, this would be a typical day. Maybe some problems getting to sleep there because of vestibular proprioceptive issues. Um, all kinds of things like that, and then changing it to this. Specific target exercise program in the morning, 
and then reset that when you get home and then thinking about how to calm your systems down to go to sleep. Who should be in charge of this? The teacher, the child, this is too much for the teacher or the parent to take control of. We all need to be in, in, uh, aware, of, aware of this and in charge of this for ourselves. Um, so is this possible? Well, this is what happened to a class of 12 children without specifically, without, it was a big cross range of, of ability, um, academic and, and daily living activities and behavior, but all 12 children commented it helped them concentrate. There were 37 positive indicators of social and emotional development and no negatives. And this was, a, this was the summary evaluation that was done in the week before Christmas. And the teacher said she thinks it was fantastic and it would be great to have it incorporated into the school day. The teacher also said that she went home feeling great. And that was the week before Christmas. The two children, the uh, two teachers in the control group said, to, as to be expected, it's, it's the end of term, you know, what could we expect? And the parents from that group gave 15 positive, but nine negative indicators of social emotional um, responses. So that's what we, we, we found. So where does learning take place? Um, from my perspective, it takes place physiologically with a combination of all of those different systems. And then where does, where does the synapse take place? That takes place in the front part of the brain and we call that cognition. But learning is a, is a whole body experience and the whole body can also stop learning and also can create anxiety because we can't sit still. It, it's physically impossible to do this sitting marathon for 13 years. We really need to get to grips with that. Um, in a, in a ACE, from an ACE perspective, I think this is such a great opportunity through the learning principles. Um, what training do our teachers need um, to let go, to release control of learning to the students? If it's physiological, you, you're going to have to allow them to be aware and also to come into or exclude themselves from situations where they're, they're just not in the room. That learning pose needs to go away. Um, so what do the students say about all of this? Let's hear from them. There's enough from me. This is great because sometimes like I get like my, I need to stretch a little bit and like it kind of annoys me a lot. So for me, when I'm in class, uh, stretching with the um, stretch band uh, helps a lot because it, uh, it helps me with my posture and it also helps me uh, by uh, getting more like attention as a teacher um for me it helps because sometimes i don't really listen very well because i'm distracted or something like that and then um i like take the like i stand on the green thing and then i try to balance and that kind of helps me that's great what would you want your teacher to know about your physical needs um i want to not only to my teacher, but to all teachers, you know, because I think a lot of people may be facing this problem, is that I think different people have different way of listening, and not not everyone can sit down and listen, and just stay in one spot. Uh, it's difficult for others and easy for others. Yet we had, we like to objectify the people who are uh, not able to sit and listen so and and how does that feel when people don't understand your needs I mean, they're asking you to sit and, and listen i would say it's sad not only for me but also to others who are facing the, this problem uh it feels like i'm not really being heard and it's definitely not helping me contribute to the class things have definitely gotten better better since i was diagnosed but before that, I wasn't able to focus and people couldn't really make sense of it. And since I didn't have a diagnosis or a label, people just assumed that I was doing this on purpose and I could control it, which I really couldn't. Okay. I think it's this. No. These two are for security. And these are for four core. Yeah. When they started, they are all on different levels and they have all advanced 
according to those to the to where they're from. But even the ones who who needed that little more time to learn the activities, they've really come on so much. They are very very enthusiastic. So yeah. it's the it's the enthusiasm. So you yeah. so you're seeing the impact from the exercise in, in the rest of their day. Yeah, I can see some of the impact on, on yeah. particularly in morning meeting and the rest of the day. All you have to do is is talk to them very quickly, and then you can turn them around. Whereas before, it might have taken a little while, a bit longer for them to for their attention to come back to us. And so you you can see little little changes, but they're, they're great changes for us. <laughs> <laughs> so having implemented some of these uh, strategies into your class and talked about different physical systems, how do you feel that could impact the school? In a, in a longer term I think aspect. I think as we as we start using the language and teaching students um, the different systems how they work how they connect with themselves uh, as they approach other year levels there that language is going to be there it's going to be more familiar they're going to be able to to talk about that with the new teacher and it's not going to be a new thing that they have to kind of teach their teachers about it's something that it'll just start becoming familiar in our school environment. And it's going to be easier for them to communicate their needs and their teachers to know, uh, well, to know that it's okay for them to communicate those needs and for them to do what they need to do in order to learn. Okay, so we'll, we'll go on. So what's the, what has been the impact of the triangle and, and building those systems? A new principal to to uh, the school, I became aware of uh, research that uh, you'd um, held in the past in a, a year two class, and uh, when I spoke to the teachers, they talked about they'd seen an increase in focus in the children. Uh, we had a really positive um, feel from that whole project about teachers, parents, and children uh, coming together as partners, and that kind of created the, this culture of of, of teachers. Uh, asking for some more information, you know, what is what is Paul doing, um, and and can we learn more about this? So, how can our teachers uh, be more responsive to our learners, and how can we really make sure that teachers are adapting their program, their environment, uh, to their curriculum, to learners, not expecting our learners to fit to their program. So I think the most important thing you've already said is, you know, students actually focusing in on what, how they learn best. And, you know, we often assume that, that either teachers are the ones in charge of that and children actually just, just follow their lead. But now we have children who are actively um, making decisions and having a voice about how they learn best. So that whole idea of, of agency or autonomy or children knowing what makes them tick uh, means that they're taking charge of their learning. So what you see in the classroom then is uh, a calm, focused environment or know when they can uh, take advantage of the relationship with the teacher to say, oh, I need a minute to reset. Okay. Have you had any interesting feedback from teachers or comments or observations? So, so teachers uh, want to learn more. Um, you're seeing teachers uh, really getting alongside children and talking about what works for them in terms of learning to learn. And so that, that deepens relationships and trust. You've got teachers talking to one another in terms of what they're doing and what could work better and have you tried this and can I learn more, um, which is a really nice um, collaborative environment to, to start growing across the school as well. What you feel about the potential for these, for this base of that triangle to enable everybody to, to, to incorporate in the day things that we, we need to be well. Now, now children are really aware of, of um, what it means to be well for mm. them. They are then starting to really um, experiment or, or predict when they need to use these, these strategies. Yeah. Um, and, and I think they're moving along the continuum to 
I've definitely seen some, some children who have internalised some of those habits. So I'm aware of a child who's moved through to, to year seven in the school who is now actively using some of those, those ideas or strategies or tools to help switch them on with their learning without any teacher support at all. And what would you say, what would you say the potential for the future is with using this knowledge base? So I, I think um, having a person like yourself alongside to coach or mentor teachers is really valuable. I've, we haven't at any stage told teachers what to do. We've given them the idea of, of some background knowledge, we've given them some, some suggestions, and then we've really let them see the impact uh, on their learners. And so I think the idea moving forward would be to continue to, to provide more information in, in the background behind the why. Um, and uh, the parent session you did recently, I think, is another good example of next steps, uh, really making sure that our, our parents and our community really understand the why and their part uh, in the partnership, that they can really make sure that our learners are truly at the centre of the, all the actions that we're taking as a school. Okay. So the, the impact... Individual physiological need is now a part of the learning process for learners. It moves vertically. Learners are in charge of their own ability to access learning. And 12 out of the 16 teachers, the 12 out of 16 class teachers engaged of their own accord. So the learning environment outside of the child and inside of the child is, is changing. There's a, there's, a, there's a cooperation, there's a conversation. back to the, the learner and what are the opportunities again the, the learning principles the ace model gives us a fantastic opportunity to go in and look at whether um, the science and neuroscience of how we physiologically develop is that within our within what the structure of what we do enabling 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 us to be well um, not teaching well-being or teaching physical education, but the habits that enable us to be well and the science that underpin that. LP7, how well do we understand the various needs of all of our learners? Well, I, I believe that in the International School of Lausanne at the moment, in the primary school, that's beginning to grow. To what extent do we act upon those and, and continually assess our effectiveness? Again, that's a in a 21st century way, every single learner, teachers included, administrators, everybody needs to come into that operation at their own speed. Um, LP8, who has the voice in the decision making that impacts the whole school community? Can the students help us inform us about what they need? LP9 is key. How well do the physical spaces and time allow us to contribute to the well-being? Physical space and time, what do we do? Who dictates that? What we need or what fits into a timetable? What the adults say or what the children need, it's, it's key. Do, do the decisions allow people to be well and are we monitoring how well people are? Because that's your indication. It's the function before the product, you know, what measure the product of wellness. An LP10, Thriving and well-being is key for all members. So, so build the habits and the systems that enable us to be well. If it's key, put it as the top priority. This is the non-negotiable. Do you remember the, one of the earlier slides? Non-negotiable things. If thriving and being well is non-negotiable, number one, then put it there. Um, questions from uh, people that, that were preloaded. Um, I just quickly run through this and just say, if anybody wants to continue a conversation, please connect through the web, web page. Uh, you can get me on email. I'm happy to have conversations with schools, um, with teachers, whatever it is, uh, make suggestions, et cetera, et cetera. The, the conversation's important, and I'd love to carry it on with you. Um, how can we help students in early years with special needs? Build them physically first. Um, everybody has needs. Uh, we call them special if, if somehow we don't fit into uh, what we're trying to assess. But, but really, it's the same physiological systems build them and see if 
some needs start to disappear because people become normal because their internal systems are working. Um, question from Taiwan, how would you encourage veteran teachers who simply want to lecture in an empty classroom? Um, the person who looked after the class of year 12, uh, the 12 year two students was in her last year uh, before she retired. Um, she experienced a change and it was all based on Gusky's theory of if the teacher experiences um, change first in, in the child, then they will be more likely to adopt the innovation. And then, so, yeah, so, so what, what happens to those teachers? Actually, the thing gets, the whole teaching gets easier because the students are more able to learn. It becomes more interactive. We're talking about real physical things. We're not talking about what's on the board or whatever else it is. So how do you encourage somebody? Um, uh, the other thing you do is you, you go straight to what's non-negotiable. You, you accredit it, you assess it. it it's, it's part of what you do. So it's, it, it has to be there. And when your accreditation, accreditation teams come in, ask them to focus on that. Say, this is what we've installed. This is what we'd like to see. Um, LP, you know, all the LPs we just said, one to 10, include it, write it in. Um, if we, next question, United Arab Emirates in the green. If we focus on the unique learning environment um, of the, each child, how can teachers be effective in the normal, uh, normal group session? Well, I'd turn that on its head and say, actually, that it's the teacher's job to make the learner effective. So how are you going to facilitate effective learning within the learner? And um, if you do that, you're going to gain time, which is what we found in, in the, the surveys and what's happened generally is that as the students become able to engage on their own, and if you're operating a 21st century model, then all of a sudden you get so much more time, you actually don't need to focus on anybody because you're giving them the, the right and the tools to develop their own physical systems uh, to engage in learning. So it's actually, I, I throw that one, turn it the other way around. Um, what are some effective methods to connect uh, classroom walkthrough observations to the learning environment? The inter, uh, assuming that's the internal learning environment. Yes, go and go and walk around the school, give it, you know, administrators, give each teacher an opportunity to walk around and see what they see. See who's W sitting and stretching the ligaments, ligaments out in the knees. See who um, goes onto the playground and doesn't do anything. These people are, are, are not physiologically developing their, their ability to learn. Um, walk around the school and see how much learning time it. Ask your teachers to time how much time the children are sitting. It's incredibly difficult to do. Incredibly, we're almost at the end of an hour here. I, I want to get up. I don't want to keep doing this. I want to move. You know, I'm sure you're all the same. How many of you are aware? Uh, sorry, and a question from me to you. How many of you are aware of synaptic pruning when we start to prune out all the, 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 the things when we get to adolescence? Go and research that. Have a look at what we're doing. We, we are instilling that sitting and listening is very important for success. And we're cutting out all this need for movement synaptically in the brain. We're chopping it out. Um, forward head posture. Again, go do some, some research on that or join the conversation afterwards about that. Um, successful learners. In your school, in your classrooms, are your learning objectives and mission and vision? Um, what are they? Is it an academic, social or physical output that we can measure? So are we looking to measure the top of that triangle? Or is it a physiological state of optimal learning within the child? What, what, do you, what are you going for? What are your non-negotiables? Which one do you start with? Because if A is the focus, it will have a diminishing effect on B. Because the way you achieve A is tough. But if it's B, then the desired outcome, sorry, if the desired outcome is B, it always enables A to thrive. So being well, well and performing at our best, is the physiological thing and not a cognitive thing. Oh, well, there's, there's a question come up in yeah. the chat asking about children with SEN in early education, early years education. Yeah. Can you support them? Yes. 
so it, it supports everybody but it, it just it, it just imagine it's it's a continuum which which goes up and as you develop anybody their ability to learn and to perform will improve if you develop them with a plan to physiologically develop their learning systems so this would help the, the classroom, is it? The, the teacher asks about how can we control them? It's not about controlling them. It's about building their capacity to be able to support themselves, yes? Yeah, so if you think, so if you're having a problem with control, I would go straight to vestibular, proprioceptive and core stability. So you say have, that in English? <laughs> yeah, and this, this, should be, this should be the language we're using. So the, the, the children at the school, uh, International School of Azan are now starting to use this language in the in the upper years, but basically there's a there's a desire to move because they don't feel secure in in the sitting down. Come and sit down on the carpet. It's not going to happen. I need to move. I need to move. So then we need to control. So we're going to use adrenaline to suppress the cerebellum and the need to move. And part of the need to move, the, the reason they feel insecure is because their core stability doesn't work. It's not able to hold their head on their shoulders to engage with the teacher. And this is quite threatening. Like all of a sudden, I'm, I'm not doing the correct thing. So we learn how to look at the teacher and smile, and then they'll go away from us. They won't do anything. These are all physiological reactions to an output that we want. We want the output, the child to smile back at us so we can tell the parent that they're doing well. So you go in and you build the course ability. So the class I watched again today, um, that started with, with one child who wasn't able to take part. And so we turned that upside down. We said, well, what, what can we do? So, well, until you build that child's phys physiological ability to take part, you're always gonna be separating and saying, what's the problem? And today I watched that child and you would not have known any difference. Uh, they can take part, they can listen. The whole corridor, which would normally have had three of us in it, had one teacher, and the whole corridor was working well. It was quite quiet. Um, children at some stage were just kind of zoning out, just like rolling on the floor. But that's what the child needs to do. D don't let there's an output. No, the child's self, uh, basically self building their physiological systems. And when they're done, they'll walk into the classroom and say, What was that thing you were talking about? And then when you give it a go, you go, Wow, I, I wasn't in control. No, they've brought themselves into the learning. They want to learn. They just can't learn when you say learning's happening now. So you put the, continue, the learning continuum physiologically inside the child and things get better for everybody. There's one, one last question. We've got about three minutes left. Okay. It's sort of a segue actually from what you're just talking about is how are self-control and task persistence being cultivated by this method? Or, and, and you're just saying that the students know what they need to do to help themselves move and get comfortable so that they can then think and concentrate. Is that effectively what we're talking about? It, it is. And there's two parts to that. So some people will say, well, this is a movement break, a self-induced movement break. Yes, you can allow that and it can be a self-induced movement break and the teacher can allow that. But this, this takes it to a different level. It says, hang on, let's front load this, all the systems. Let's develop these systems. Just like you're training for a marathon, you don't just go out and run from try to do a marathon. You have to build the, that, those systems to function, to be able to do that, to give you that output. And this is exactly the same for learning and performances. You must build the vestibular the proprioceptive. You must be aware of it. You must do something which is a habit, which creates wellness. This is wellness. And when you, when you create this within physiologically, then the problems that we assess will diminish because you can take part because your systems work. You can run the marathon because you trained to do it. Mm. Paul, thank you so much for all that you've done. We have finished in perfect timing. I appreciate that you've uh, had to sit still for an hour to share this with us, but I really do uh, <laughs> think that a lot of people will have uh, both appreciated the ideas and will be looking for more information. So I know you've given your website, it's been uh, shared a number of times in the chat. And so thank you very much for all you've done.
can I say, but Paul, thank you again. And um, I look forward to hearing how you help further students get able to access their learning internally and learn how to look after themselves. Thank you thank so you. much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye everyone.